Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts. The moment has arrived for Vulcan Centaur. Even though this rocket has flown once already, this week things are going to get even more critical. This flight absolutely has to go off flawlessly, or ULA is going to be in very deep trouble. Even though they're not carrying a payload of any sort of significance, it's just a dummy weight to simulate a payload. The importance of this launch cannot be overstated, and the importance of this rocket, especially to the U.S. Space Force, can also not be overstated, because Vulcan Centaur, in spite of its failings and in spite of its delayed delivery, can do things that no other rocket, not even Starship, can do. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon. Once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. As some of you may recall, this rocket won me a bet a few months ago when it managed to achieve orbit and deliver Peregrine to the appropriate trajectory towards the moon, even though, of course, Peregrine didn't exactly deliver on its promise. But nevertheless, this rocket did its job before Starship could reach orbit, saving me from an embarrassing tattoo. That being the case, though, there's a lot more about Vulcan Centaur that's important to the future of space flight than sparing me an embarrassing tattoo. This rocket is going to be lifting off on the 4th, presumably it might be a little bit later depending on how wet dress rehearsals, static fires, etc. go, but it will be launching from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral, and it will not be paying any sort of significant payload. It will just be an inert payload, and it will be carrying out some demonstrations of associated with future Centaur 5 technologies. What does that mean exactly? Well, let's talk a little bit about ULA's philosophy when it comes to this rocket. First of all, ULA does not intend to reuse the booster on Vulcan in the same way that SpaceX reuses their booster on Falcon 9 and eventually with Starship. Instead, they intend to bring the engines back only with an inflatable re-entry system called Lofted, something that they've already tested, a technology that seems to work extremely well, and a technology that will bring the Blue Origin BE-4 engines, which are intended to be reusable, back safely after the booster is expended. This doesn't save quite as much money as the Falcon 9 approach does, but at the same time, it allows Vulcan to make use of all of its fuel while it's ascending, and not just some of it. This system, by the way, is called smart reusability. However, ULA isn't going to be testing this technology with this particular launch. They are instead going to be testing the capabilities of the Centaur 5 upper stage. Originally, Centaur 5 was called the ACES stage, a stage that was designed for a lot more than most upper stages on rockets can accomplish. First of all, it carries 54 metric tons worth of propellant, which is more than double the propellant that the Centaur 3 upper stage could carry. It's also manufactured out of extremely lightweight materials. It has double the thrust of the old Centaur 3, but the most important feature of this upper stage is its ability to extend its lifespan. It has an optional kit, which they may put on this particular launch, that can extend its usability out for several months, rather than just a few hours. What use does this serve? Well, Centaur Centaur 5 is designed to be a reusable upper stage that can be reused in space rather than on Earth. It can be used as a refuelable lunar tug, for example, or you could also use it as a fuel depot as pictured here. You have a couple of Centaur 5s linked together. Actually, these are ACES stages. This is an older concept, but still the idea is the same along with a sun shield. And in addition, you can see docked to this fuel depot, a conceptual vehicle called the Altair, which was around during the time of the Constellation Project 
project. Obviously, none of them ever got built, but it's a more advanced and more ambitious lunar transport system and lunar lander. Again, using a modified Centaur upper stage as the propulsion system for this lunar ship. So, lots of different applications for the Centaur 5, and this is going to be the first orbital test for this technology associated with this stage. And it appears that Tori Bruno's primary ambition when it comes to the Centaur is to use it to build an Earth-to-Moon infrastructure, transport infrastructure making it easier to deliver cargoes from low Earth orbit all the way to TLI, something that is difficult to do now if you're launching from the surface of the Earth, but a lot easier if you have a tug in orbit or a refueling depot, something like that. Again, these ideas were in place with ULA long before Elon Musk started to describe refueling technologies with Starship. Of course, ULA depended on government funding, and at the time, the most powerful people in the government who were associated with spaceflight also wanted SLS to happen, and refueling depots would make SLS obsolete. Okay, so all of that is well and good, but what makes this launch so important, especially to the U.S. military? Well, the military will not allow a launch provider to take their satellites into orbit until they have proven their new rockets. So you have to launch at least three times before the military will allow any of their payloads to ride on your rockets. So why is this launch important? Because this is only the second flight of Vulcan Centaur, not the third. Well, it's because if you turn over all of your engineering diagrams, all of your secrets regarding your rocket, every single detail to the military for them to review, then they will allow their payloads to fly on your rocket if it only makes two flights, not three, which is something ULA was compelled to do because it took so long for them to get this rocket into service for a variety of reasons, but primarily because it took Blue Origin such a long time to get the BE-4 engine into service. All of that having been said then, ULA doesn't have to take any sort of active payload, anything that ambitious into space on this launch. They just have to get it there and demonstrate that they're going to be able to deliver a substantial payload, not just to low Earth orbit, but probably all the way out to geosynchronous orbit, which is where most military payloads have to go. So again, why is this so important? If ULA fails on this launch, then can't the military just use SpaceX for all of their missions? Well, here's the most important difference between Vulcan Centaur and Falcon Heavy, which delivers the vast majority of payloads for the U.S. Space Force. Vulcan Centaur has a much bigger fairing, much bigger fairing, and that's going to make it extremely useful for certain types of military payloads that are designed for five meter fairings. Even if Falcon Heavy eventually gets an extended fairing, something that they've been planning for a very long time, but something that Elon Musk really doesn't want to invest money in because he wants all of the effort to be focused on Starship, it's still not going to have the width, the kind of diameter that ULA's fairing is going to have. Vulcan Centaur is going to have the biggest fairing of any operational rocket except for SLS and Starship. And Starship cannot really be considered operational right now. SLS is ridiculously expensive. And yes, eventually when New Glenn flies, it's going to have a bigger fairing. But that's when New Glenn flies. Who knows when the hell that's actually going to happen. And even when New Glenn does fly, Vulcan Centaur is going to have certain advantages. Because of its lightweight and because of the enormous amount of thrust delivered by a combination of solid rocket boosters and the BE-4 engines, Vulcan Centaur can actually deliver heavier payloads to higher orbit than New Glenn can. 14.4 metric tons to geosynchronous transfer orbit as opposed to 13 tons for New Glenn, and it gets even worse when you're talking about the moon. 13 metric tons to translunar injection orbit, or TLI, as opposed to 8.5 metric tons for New Glenn. So Vulcan Centaur can deliver larger volume payloads that are 
they're heavier to higher orbits than any rocket in service, except for Falcon Heavy. The thing with Falcon Heavy, though, is the volume. Yes, Falcon Heavy can carry heavier payloads up to higher orbits than Vulcan Centaur can, but they're not going to be as large physically. And as far as price is concerned, Falcon Heavy is about identical as far as the cost to launch as a Vulcan Centaur is, because in many cases, geosynchronous orbits require that Falcon Heavy expend at least the core stage. All they're reusing are the side boosters, meaning that at least a substantial portion of Falcon Heavy is getting expended with ever, every launch, which is not all that different than what's happening with Vulcan Centaur. And on top of that, Elon Musk is passing on the cost of an extended stage development to the U.S. military. He doesn't want to develop this thing for Falcon Heavy, and so he's passing the cost onto the U.S. Space Force, which increases the cost of every military launch, meaning that in some cases, especially with some recent launches, you ULA can actually undercut SpaceX on price. So it's very important that we have this competition here. If Vulcan Centaur fails, if ULA fails, then SpaceX will maintain their stranglehold on military launches. And even though Starship may be able to pick up the slack when it comes to large volume payloads that the military may have planned for the future, Starship cannot get to geosynchronous orbit without out extensive refueling. It will make the whole process a lot more complicated if the military has to use Starship for some of these missions. So Vulcan Centaur is surprisingly important. Not something that gets a whole lot of press compared to SpaceX rockets, but still a very vital piece of technology. And when you consider things like smart reusability and the Centaur 5 upper stage, it's actually pretty innovative as well. Instead of just trying to copy SpaceX's reusability format, they have their own. And I'll tell you, as long as a company is trying to be innovative, as long as they're not just relying on powerful lobbyists to get their government contracts, but are instead relying on new and intriguing types of technologies in order to compete, I'm always going to support that type of company. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I would like to thank the large number of people, both on PayPal and Cash App, Super Chats, etc., who have been supporting my efforts to get to the IAC convention in Milan, where I'll have a chance to talk to SpaceX representatives, Blue Origin, ULA, everybody. So if you'd like to support that, all the details are in the description. And until next time, stay angry about space.